you tell Alan. Good. Good. And good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Let's all stand. Thank you for coming here tonight. Hopefully we'll have more ad as the minutes draw on. Let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity and blessing of being able to gather together again and worship you. And Father, we're so grateful uh, that you give us a free country and have enabled us to do this. And Lord, we want to bring glory and honor to your name we know where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And uh, Lord, we want to really bring glory and honor to you. We want you to work in our hearts. And, and Lord, America needs God's people gathering and praying. And we just ask you to have mercy on our country. And we pray for a great night tonight around your word and around you as we worship you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing. Except for you. All right, Sacro Hymnals, we'll open up, open up to him 383, The Solid Rock, him 383. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When 
When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, Dressed in his righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ of solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Uh, just a few announcements here. The, uh, if you would like a, a box of offering envelopes uh, and do not al already get them, please see Pastor Lyon. There's some, still some boxes left back there. Uh, we are preparing for missions giving in uh, 2023, and if you would like to be part, please fill out the uh, Faith pr uh, Promise giving slip on the back table. There's two halves, uh, put one, one half in the uh, uh, offering plate and the other half keep for a reminder. And our business meeting will be on Wednesday, January 25th, and uh, we'll be voting to add a new member. and. Uh, and a new deacon and a new budget and our budget meeting with the deacons will be after the prayer meeting on Wednesday January 18th uh, the business meeting will be on zoom and in person this time I'll have the usher come forward as we take our general offering that's bound word prayer for the offering Dear Lord, we just thank you for your many blessings, Lord. We thank you for your provision, Lord. We thank you that you've supplied all our needs in this 30 years, Lord. We ask that you would continue to do so. Help us to be wise as we come up on our budget meeting uh, with the spending of those funds. We ask this in your precious name, Lord. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Be still, my soul. Amen. With that in mind, I want you to be praying for uh, for Peg Willie. I've been thinking a lot about Peg, and she's really going through what my parents are going through. And uh, it's a it's it's ground that I have not yet trod. Getting older, well, I have trod it, <laughs> but um, you know, I think of my parents and I think of Peg. And as you get older, you start losing a lot of friends, and you're more alone and um, it can be very overwhelming. And that song, Be Still My Soul, is what we need to pray for Peg, that God's peace will just flood her soul. Mm. And uh, in fact, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now, okay? Father, we're so grateful that we can come to you any time, night, and day. And Lord, we prayed for a bunch of people this morning. Uh, I want to again lift them up, just you know who they are. Please tend to each one. And uh, Lord, I add to that our neighbor Tony. I uh, just pray for him and his dear wife that you'd minister to them and draw them to Calvary. And then we pray again for Peg, Lord, that you just comfort her and help her. I pray for Tom that you give him safety as he travels and just allow their his time. Help him to be able to just be a blessing and a strength to his mom. And uh, Father, again, we thank you for your word. Thank you for those that are joining us online. Thank you for the great morning you gave us and the encouraging turnout and just the blessing of being able to gather together and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for those that come far and near uh, to come and worship together. And I pray that you'd be with our worship tonight and bless your word as we read it. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, Jeremiah chapter 2. Please turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. Our text this evening is verses 4 to verse 8. But I'm going to begin the scripture reading in verse 1. So we'll read verses 1 through 8. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. As I look to the end of Jeremiah, I am reminded that it is a long long book it is uh, 52 chapters and we started it technically in 2022 and I know we're not going to finish it in 2023 uh, but it's okay it's exciting to go verse by verse through the scriptures God's word is just going to unfold before us and uh, there is no verse that God doesn't have something for us uh, and we're not going to twist it um, but we're going to get something out of it. So Jeremiah chapter 2, follow along as I read the first eight verses, and then we'll remain standing for prayer. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquities have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain. Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts, and of pits, through a land of drought, and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through, and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country, to eat the fruit thereof, and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered... Ye defiled my land, and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. May God bless his word. And uh, let's bow together in prayer. Again, Father, so thank you for this time uh, when we come to your word. It is how you speak to us. Father, it has pleased you by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And it has also pleased you 
to grow your people, to equip the saints through the preaching, the foolishness of preaching as the world would look at it. But Father, to us it is the power of God. It is how you train and equip us, how you grow us. And Father, I pray that we would take heed to the word tonight. Help me as I expound the scriptures and exhort the congregation. Uh, May the Spirit of God lead us. May our minds be captivated by the truths of Scripture. And Lord, though this exhortation was to a people from long ago, your people, uh, they were for our, it is for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So Lord, help us to have hope, help us to grow, and help us to glorify you tonight. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. Take your hymnals to turn to hymn 529, It Is Well With My Soul, hymn 529. When peace like a river attendeth my way, When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well.
Amen. Thank you, Tal Allah. What an amazing song. Whenever, whenever I think of it I, and we sing it, I think of the writer, Horatio Spafford, and realize the emotions that that man wrote that hymn. He had just lost, he had three or four daughters, and he just lost them all due to a, a tragedy at sea. And it was as he was grieving the loss of his precious family, his daughters, that the words to this hymn came to him. Um, so out of deep, deep emotion. Uh, and what, a, what, a wor what words to think about when you're going through such grief. It is well with my soul. I hope you can say that. Jeremiah chapter 2. Let's head back there. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Title of tonight's message from verses 4 through 8 is walking away from God. Last week we had noted that all of chapter 2 seems to follow a pattern of the ancient times of Jeremiah's day uh, from other nations, Assyria and, and so forth, uh, multitudes. And it had been a, a historical thing that apparently when anyone rebelled against the king, there was a special legal format in which you brought the charges against them. And uh, for some reason, I haven't found that this out yet in my studies, but it's, been, it's called a rib pattern, R-I-B pattern, probably has probably an acrostic, we'll let you know that down the road. Uh, but it, it followed this pattern, and, and all of chapter 2 is this, uh, in one way or another. Uh, first of all, there was an appeal to the vassal, or the servant, the, to pay heed, and a summons to the earth and sky to act as a witness. And so the first challenge here uh, is a call uh, of who it is to, all of Judah, all of Israel. And then number two, it is a series of questions each of which carry an implied accusation. Um, we're just going to look at th uh, four of these uh, rib patterns here in this text. So there is a series of questions with implied accusations. Number three, it is a recollection of past benefits bestowed on the vassal uh, with some statement of the offenses by which they have broken the treaty or the covenant. And that was Israel's... They had broken their covenant with God. And then four... Uh, a reference to the futility of outside help. Now this follows, and we could see this in other places in Scripture. We'll see it later on in Jeremiah, that when Israel was in trouble, and there was a threatening nation coming against them, unfortunately, instead of fleeing to God, they often looked to a neighboring country uh, to help them. Uh, and God wanted them to come to Him first. Uh, and oftentimes, He was their last appeal, and sometimes... In our Christian lives, uh, he is the last appeal. Uh, and then, um, fourth, a reference to the futility of outside help. And then number five is a declaration of the culpability or responsibility with a threat of judgment. So, here we're going we're gonna to see that Jeremiah, God asked the people of Israel four questions that were in these verses. Um, number two, which is of this rib pattern. Number two, number three, number four, and... Number five, I believe it is. Verse five, six, seven, and eight. Verse five, God is saying, he's asking him a series of questions. And in verse five, he says, where did I fail you? In verse six, he, in a sense, reminisces. He says, what about the good old days? And by the way, as I've been studying this, I also thought of the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians. Um, it seems like, you know, maybe Paul was very, obviously he was familiar with the scriptures and Jeremiah. And perhaps this was in his mind because when he laid out some of his accusations against the Galatians, it seemed to follow this same pattern. You know, he would go back to the good old days. He says, uh, you know, where is the blessedness you spake of? Uh, he says, you would have plucked out your own eyes for me. And God does the same thing in a sense. He's, he's talking about the good old days, what he did for them. And then four, verse seven, uh, he's saying, what have you done? What have you done? They broke their covenant with God. And then finally, he accuses, he challenges the leaders. Where are the leaders? Verse 8. The leaders who should be leading you to me, who should be representing me, are not fulfilling their responsibility. So let's just jump right in. Verse 2, or verse 4, our first verse is kind of, uh, it reiterates in verse, it, verse 2. 
If you look at Jeremiah 2, verse 2, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, and saying thus, well, verse 4 is kind of re repeat of that. Look at verse 4. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and that, that would be Israel, and all the families of the house of Israel. Now, God often refers to Judah and Jerusalem as Israel. Now, remember, at this point in Jeremiah's ministry, the, northern, the tribes had already, you know, there was already the divided kingdom where ten, the, you had the ten northern tribes that were referred to as Israel, and you had the two southern tribes which were referred to as Judah. Well, Israel, the ten northern tribes, had long ago, like a hundred years before Jeremiah's time, had been conquered by Assyria and taken away. So really, Jeremiah is here ministering to the southern two kingdoms, Judah, but often he will refer to them, you know, even though what happened to Israel, he will refer to them as Israel, the house of Israel. And he does so here. So let's jump in. First question he asked them, and this is, this is amazing. Look at verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Now remember, this whole text that we're looking at, God is using the relationship of a husband and a wife, of, a, of a unfaithfulness in a marriage. And he is charging Israel with being unfaithful to him. And he's taking it very personal. Even as a wife, if a husband was unfaithful, it would devastate her. And, and there seems to be a play on the words in the Hebrew in that last phrase. Look at verse 5 again. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me? God's saying, what, what did I do wrong? Where did I fail you? that they are gone far from me and have walked away from me. What did I do wrong? You know, you can imagine a, a wife whose husband has been unfaithful. That is a very personal thing. She would say, where did I fail you? And that's what God is saying. And then here's the seeming, there, there's a good possibility, there's a play on words here in the Hebrew. In they have walked after vanity, and that's the Hebrew word hebel, which speaks of delusion or you know vain vanity. They have walked after vanity and are become vain. Now there there could be a play on words here because there's a the word for Baal literally has the idea of being vain and empty. And many think that Jeremiah or that God is using a play on word because Baal was the the primary Canaanite deity. And that was, that's what broke the straws back, as it were. That's who Israel turned after, the gods of the Canaanites and Baal. And this is where, this is God's accusation. He is charging them with having forsaken their covenant. And so the Hebrew would be like, it'd be like in the Hebrew he would be saying, you are pursuing empty phantoms, which is the idea of vanity, and themselves becoming empty. So, and that's what they were doing. They had left the true God who brought them through the wilderness, out of the land of Egypt, who showed himself and delivered them time and time again. And they fled to him during that whole time. Yes, they complained. Yes, they doubted him. But they cried out to him. It was to him that they brought their complaint. And he would deliver them over and over again. But remember, it was after they entered into covenant at Mount Sinai when they entered into the promised land and they began to fall after and go after the false gods. And that's what God, and that's, that's where apostasy took place. And they literally pursued empty phantoms. And by doing that, they became empty. And I submit to you that when God's people People who get saved and tap into the, the greatest source of, the only source of grace, the God of heaven, the omnipotent power, when you and I get saved and we, we are in a relationship with God, when we are abiding in the vine, as Jesus talked about in, in, uh, in Matthew 15 or John 15, and 
when you and I walk away from God, it's like we're leaving the all-sufficient one and whatever we are leaving Him for is, it's, again, it's pursuing empty phantoms. It's like, the, the, you know, they had this real, the real God, the creator of the universe, and they exchanged it for Baal? How pathetic. What an insult to the living God of heaven. And so, I, I, this is heartbreaking, and I, I hope you see this here. Can you hear? This is, God is taking this very personal. What iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me? Where did I, where did I forsake you? What did I do wrong? And of course, what's the answer? He didn't do anything wrong, did he? God is faithful. It was not his fault. But our God is heartbroken. It, did he do anything wrong? I, I came across a quote just, just this week, in fact. It was on someone's Facebook profile, and it, they were take a snapshot of a book, and I have no idea what the book is. Um, but it's a great quote. Listen to this statement. It's about secularism, and this author put this. Secularism is a worldview that says reality can be understood without the aid of religion. In the West, it's presented as the default mode for navigating life. People talk about losing their religion or losing their faith, but they never talk about gaining secularism. They treat secularism as the safe level playing field on which other worldviews compete against each other. That is so true. In other words, people, people look at secularism as that's the evil, you know, even playing field and everything is kind of compared against that. I left the faith. It's like, oh, and he returned to this, to where everybody is or something like that. But he, this author goes on. But in fact, secularism is one of the competing teams and right now it's struggling to stay on its feet. You see, when somebody leaves God, whether they claim to become an atheist or an agnostic, or they just say, I don't think I believe that stuff anymore. You and I have to realize, folks, they are literally forsaking God. And, and there's no default mode here. They are literally walking away from truth. I mentioned this, but it's so, so, this whole chapter. Remember last week? God talked about, you've left, I forget how it's worded, thine espousals. Uh, verse 2, uh, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness. It, this is a relationship. And God is using his relationship with his people, and he's using the idea of a marriage because you and I can relate to that. We can relate to human emotion. Can, we can relate to love. We can relate to having someone that we care about and entering into a covenant relationship. If you've been married, you've, you've entered into a covenant relationship. And there's so much at stake. And that's exactly the way God saw it. You have forsaken me. An un unfaithful husband, again. Um, just you know, imagine this scenario that um, a husband is unfaithful to his wife. Charlie was dealing with, God bless Charlie for dealing with the topic he dealt with in Bible study. Uh, I, told, I told Charlie, he made my job so much easier. And he really does. He, he dealt with the, I don't need to deal with the hard topics, Charlie. I'll give it to Charlie, he'll take care of it. But he did a great job, he really did. But what a, what a difficult issue. Probably one of the hardest things in counseling uh, is, is, you know, marriage is so wonderful because of, it is of God. But because we are fallible sinners, we mess it up. And, and it's only, I made this statement in the Sunday school too, is it, it's only our sin that complicates things. Charlie talked about it gets complicated. It's not, there's no problem with marriage. Marriage isn't what complicates things. It's our failures and our human, you know, it's our sin, always. We're the ones that make it complicated. And so when a husband is unfaithful to his wife, can you imagine this scenario? 
where the wife is devastated and you got this husband who, you, his attitude is everything. Can you imagine if he came up to his wife and said, hey, look, I'm sorry, would you get over it? You think that's the right way to approach it? No. He should be devastated. He should realize, what have I done? And this God is trying to get Israel to see how affected he is to get that response. God has taken this personal. All that I've done for you, I've entered into a relationship, I've delivered you. Remember the word deliver, we see that throughout this, this book in Jeremiah. He delivered them in, you know, through the, out of Egypt and through the desert. And now, you know, I've always marveled. Um, we did prison ministry for 12 years, three years in Chester County and nine years at Delaware County. And um, we have a few, two men, uh, one that's a very precious, precious man uh, to me. But, you know, I noticed it with, with a lot of the inmates. Um, there was two attitudes. And it was always refreshing to me when, when a, a, a guy would tell me, you know, I, I am guilty. I, I did it. And I'm, I'm broken about it. Tender heart, that's a blessing. And that's the blessing of someone that we know close. But then there'd be other guys. <laughs> and I remember, I remember, you know, they'd have the attitude that, all right, listen, I did. Would you get over it? You know, <laughs> and it's like, wait a minute, you don't understand. And, and a lot of people in our church, there was one guy a particular way back, really had a problem with that. And, and I don't blame them. We need to take our sins seriously. And that's what God is trying to impress on Israel. This is personal. This is not, listen, this is not on the level of going through the wilderness and oh, you're thirsty. And oh, in fact, in fact let's go back to there because um, this, let's, this goes to the second point, verse 6. The good old days. This is, I love this. Look at verse 6 if you would. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 6. Neither said they. So he's now bringing out the accusation. This is a charge of rebellion against him. And he says, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of desert and pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? Now God is doing some reminiscing. And he's saying, now again, we, we've gone through, we've looked in Numbers. In fact, turn to Numbers 11, because we're going to look at an example of what he is reminiscing about. And when we read Israel's complaining and their murmuring, it did not make God happy. You know, they were complaining, they were murmuring. But here's the thing. They were still going to him. They were bringing their complaint to him. And, and, that's, and God, in verse 6, it's like he's saying, I'm not even in the discussion anymore. I, I'm not even, you know, when you used to complain and murmur, at least you were complaining and murmuring, and, and it was to me, and you were looking for me to rescue, and you were wondering why I didn't rescue me, or you, but you were still looking to me. Now, they were looking to other gods like Baal. That hurt. That was personal. Look at let's so let's go back, and I love going to this, these texts because, and I probably do the same thing. We look at, and we, you know we look back at the past, the good old days. Do you realize what the good old? Let's look at it. Numbers chapter eleven, and verse four. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said. Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. What? We remember those days in Egypt. It was like a smorgasbord. Things were great back then. Wait a minute. They were in slavery. Verse 6, but now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now manna, and folks, that was God's immediate direct 
meeting of a need in a supernatural way. And just it, it's such a testimony of how the fact that, you know, we as human beings, we, we tire of the routine. I imagine the first bites of manna, maybe those first few days, maybe in the first few weeks, I was like, oh, have you tasted this? Bread from heaven. It really was bread from heaven. Wouldn't you like to get a sample? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to be... Wouldn't it be great if they sold it exactly... Whatever it was made of, however God provided it, if you and I could get it and taste exactly what, what they tasted. I mean, that'd be, that'd be neat. But they had been doing this for so long now. Just like when God blesses us consistently by providing us with something that blesses us and meets our need, we tend to take it for granted. We tend to forget how special it is. And then we start complaining. It's human nature. And that's what they did. In fact, they, things were so messed up in their mind that they started looking back at slavery as the good old days. Verse 6, Now our soul is dried away. Oh, there is nothing at all beside this manna. Oh my, freedom isn't so great after all. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof was the color of bedlam. Verse 8, And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Verse 10, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? He's talking about himself. Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Moses got a taste, and anyone in leadership is going to get a taste of how God feels when the people are not satisfied with God. And Moses is like, why are you putting this on me? And I, you, know, you can imagine God saying, Moses, you're just getting a little taste of how I feel. Because they have forsaken me. Now, so this was back when they complained. But now, let's go back to Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah 2 and verse 6. Now it's like God is saying, Boy, the, I remember the good old days where you would complain to me when you weren't satisfied. But you'd still complain to me. You still came to me. You know, those were the good old days for God, in a sense. And now again, verse 6, Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? That led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought. Remember the lack of water? And they complained again. But who was it that met their need every time? God. God guided them. God delivered them through the promised land, or through the, through the wilderness. They didn't even need to get new shoes. God supernaturally met their needs. And so, they were not guilty of apostasy. They were guilty of, you know, unbelief and complaining and all that. But this is this more serious charge of apostasy. Because they are now exchanging the real God for a phantom. A God that did not exist. And God took it very personal. You know, it's interesting... That uh, God will often, you know, the Bible says, look not every man on his own things, but on the things of others. God, remember the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. God wants to get in on our mind that we can, we are best in a relationship with someone else if we can put ourselves in their position, in, even in our relationship with them. Best thing for a husband it's if you can see your failures as a husband through the eyes of your wife, it'll help you become a better husband. But some husbands don't have the ability to do that. Well, you know, pity the wife who does not have the opportunity to appeal. And it's a very humbling thing, guys. We are proud, aren't we? I mean, we're all proud. Who likes someone to say, you're not perfect. <laughs> you have failed and, you know, and share that. But folks, our wives need the ability to do that. And we need to learn to, to stop for a minute, 
and try to understand where they're coming from so that we can, first of all, feel that and then grow and change. That's exactly what God is doing. And God does that often. Remember Job? Remember in, in the book of Job, God was allowing, he was still in charge, he was still in control. He allowed Job to go through some, some things. And um, Job, it, it's kind of like that thing where Job did complain. He had no idea, what are you doing? But Job never forsook the Lord. He didn't turn to other gods. He, he maintained his integrity. He held fast. He was convinced that God was good. And this whole experience of his life didn't make any sense. So he complained for a while. But in chapter 38, of, in Job chapter 38, you know, in, in the whole book of Job up to chapter 38, you got Job complaining, then you got his friends offering their profound insight, which ended up making it harder for Job. And then in chapter 38, it says this, because God finally answers. And remember, Job asked a million questions, proverbially. proverbially. It says in Job 38, verse 1, Then the Lord answered out of the, Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsels by words without knowledge? You realize what he's saying? Who is this that darkeneth counsel, my counsel, by words without knowledge? It's like he's saying, Who is this that is obscuring my counsel with ignorant words? And then he does this and he says, He says, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. He says, okay, I want you to stand up, and like a man, I want you to listen to what I have to say. And then he starts asking him questions. And he's trying to, he's trying to get Job to, he's putting Job in his spot, and basically reminding Job, I'm God. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou canst understand. Who hath laid the measures thereof? In other words, the measurements, the boundaries. Um, who fixed the dimensions and the creation? If thou knowest, who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And he goes on and asks all these questions like, Hey, Job, when I created the world, where were you? And what's Job going to say? Oh, I was there. I remember that. No, he wasn't there. And God is, is saying, Job, you have forgotten who I am. I am the omnipotent God that created the world. And and after God answered dozens and dozens, maybe 48 to 52, I forget how many questions God asked Job. Job never responded and never asked another question of God because he got the right perspective. Israel, Judah specifically, needed that lesson. But they weren't even in a place like Israel in the wilderness, or like Job going through this trial where they were complaining and they didn't understand what was going on. Israel was at a point where they had, they had walked away from the true God and were now looking to phantom gods. Gods that did not exist. And they had become vain. So look now at... Verse 7, so we have where uh, God asks them, where did I fail you? What have I done wrong? Number 2, what, what about the good old days? Remember the good old days of their complaining. And then number uh, 3, what have you done? Verse 7, and I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. Is that the thanks I get? Is what God is saying. All that I did for you. And you went in this beautiful land that I gave you and delivered you. And you defiled my land and you made mine heritage an abomination. By going after the gods of the Canaanites. And then finally verse 8. Where are the leaders? And this is that last part of the rib pattern. Verse five, uh, point 5 in the legal uh, legal form that they would do in charging uh, a lesser authority of rebellion. And this was a a declaration of culpability and a threat of judgment. Look at verse 8. The priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal. 
and walked after things that do not profit. Phantom gods that, that did not exist. Now listen to the three, the threefold challenge here. The people that were responsible for fourfold priests. The priests were not only responsible for the um, for the sacrifices, but they were also interpreters of the law. And uh, also, they had and, and they were interpreters of the law, the oracles of God, and they also had the proper use of what was the ephod, and then the urim and the thummim. If you remember, that's how God would communicate. And that was all their area. And, and they had, uh, the priests weren't even inquiring of the Lord. So the priest's responsibility to seek the Lord through these various means that they had, they weren't even doing that. There was no seeking the Lord here. They had to handle the law. That probably uh, opens up and also includes the Levites. Both the priests and the Levites, the broader category. Remember, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Uh, so the priests had more specific responsibilities, but all the Levites were part of the worship service and the tabernacle or the temple in some way or another. And so the, the, um, the Levites were also interpreters of the law. They were the ones who handled the law. Uh, and it says, they that handled the law knew me not. Wow, that would be like someone today. And I share with you, I wish I had this quote in front of me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I heard this testimony of an interview of a pastor who has really become very well knowledge on certain things that I'm interested in theologically. And yet God got him in this point in his life, and he's younger than me, where God said, you know, that's great, you're a pastor, you're studying my word, you're, you're sound theologically, but you don't love me anymore. You're not, you're not pursuing Jesus. Jesus Christ and loving him is not your first passion. And it really humbled him. So here he is going through the motions, doing all the stuff, but he had lost that love for the Savior. That is so easy to do. So easy to do. Even when you're going to church all the time and you're reading your Bible every day, you're doing the religious thing. Remember, Christianity is not what you do. It's who you are in the relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Then we go on, the rulers, or the shepherds, the, the term shepherd was commonly used in this time. They didn't have pastors, as it were, and yet the word pastor, shepherd, is the same. But uh, this was commonly used to describe political leaders because they were overseers and, and uh, rulers of the people. And so it says here, uh, the pastors also transgress me. And then, and then here's, this is again going down to the root charge. The prophets prophesied by Baal. So they prophesied in Baal's name and followed after the useless ones. Remember, they pursued empty phantoms and they became empty themselves. When the prophets were no longer seeking God. They, were, they, they stopped seeking the living God and started pursuing... Again, I love the fa phantom... What is it again? Phantom... Pursuing empty phantoms. Some, something appealed to them about Baal. And they're like, hey, we got to get on this bandwagon. But in order to get on that bandwagon, they had to forsake the true God. How tragic. There is, uh, what's happening to our leaders today in the church? There is a leader, a man that was a pastor for many years that uh, wrote several books that were a blessing to me. And when I read this guy's books, he dealt with things that were very practical um, to help kids, to help people battling, you know, in relationships. And, and he wrote one book as a pastor that um, really hit a nerve with me because I thought, this guy knows, he knows what it's like to pastor. And, and in, in one book that he wrote, this might have been the last book he wrote before the event, was called Why Church Matters. <laughs> you better believe that's, you know, pastors have an interest in that. And in this blurb that he came up with, I, I read that and I thought, man, this, this is going to be a great book. This guy knows exactly what we're going through. He says, are, he, so he's, he's challenging the church. And he says, are you dating the church? 
We are a generation of consumers, independent and critical. We attend church, but we don't want to settle down and truly invest ourselves. We're not into commitment. We only want to date the church. Is this what God wants for us? Why church matters remind us that faith was never meant to be a solo pursuit. The church is a place where God grows us, encourages us, and uses us best. Loving Jesus Christ involves passionate commitment to his church around the world and down the street. We can't be apathetic. It's time to fall in love with the family of God. And I said, amen to that. There's someone who knows he's got a pastor's heart. And I can sense, no doubt, he had been disappointed as a pastor leading God's people, born-again Christians. He's leading them. And he's seeing their disinterest in God. And because he's a pastor, it's affecting him. It's breaking his heart when he sees people. I like that idea. It's like you're just, you're just dating, the, you're dating the Lord. You're dating the church. He, he just saw a great lack of commitment. And it frustrated him. We know who wrote the book? Josh Harris. Who then later left the Lord. Did what Israel did. He apostatized. He even used that word apostasy. He said, I'm no longer a Christian. I'm like, what? What just happened? What did you do? You know, you, I thought you had the heartbeat of a pastor and you had that burden. And now you're going to walk out on God? How sad that is. And then, of course, one wiser elder statesman uh, made the, the challenge to Josh Harris he, after he apostatized. And he said, you've not, he said, you've immersed yourself in the culture of Christianity, but you've not fallen in love with Jesus Christ. And, and I think of this last quote, it's time to fall in love with the family of God. And if that pastor's right, you know, he, he was immersed in the culture of the church. But how can you walk out on the Lord? I want to close by having you turn to, um, to John chapter 6. Because there is a New Testament application here in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Everybody there? Keep looking. While I look for my page 3. Okay. There we go. John chapter 6 and verse 66. So Jesus is preaching. You may remember this. He said some hard things. And in John chapter 6... And then in verse 66, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know, it would be that thing. They, they went to that level playing ground of secularism. No, they didn't. They walked away from God. And by embracing secularism or whatever they did embrace, it was not a level playing field. It was forsaking the God of heaven. How tragic that is. It is like Demas. Paul wrote and he said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Folks, Israel had forsaken God. And I submit to you that God's people in America are forsaking Him. I want to read to you, I want to close with an article that was in World Magazine and was in a recent article, I forget the name, which author, but the title was A Tidal Wave of Church Closings. And I'm just going to read to you part of it. He said, from those of us who were children of the 40s or 50s, and that would not be me, it wasn't, wasn't uncommon to worry a little at the thought that a fierce cadre of Russian communist soldiers might suddenly burst through the doors of our church, arrest the pastor, and lock the place up. Church doors are indeed being locked in more places than we like to think, as Christians are being told forcibly, forcefully that they may not open, openly practice their faith. He said, but in our own setting these days, I think we Americans should worry a good bit more about another trend that I doubt we're prepared for. That movement is the locking of thousands of church doors from the inside. 
Just because there are so few folks in there to keep things going. Get ready, America. Get ready for the huge collapse from within that is soon to result in the locking of hundreds and then thousands of church doors across our country, all from the inside. And then he gives examples of various cho- churches. He gives um, statistics that churches are closing in record number. And then he says, and, and after he gives these examples of some of these other denominations, he says, sooner than you think, it will be our turn, uh, the evangelical born-again Bible-believing church. Thousands of them, too, are teetering on the edge of their existence. Stick your head in the door on a typical Sunday and see how many children are around. If you were a regional man- man- manager for McDonald's, you'd close the place in a jiffy. Except for the grit and determination of a few old stalwarts, it would already have happened. But there's no promise for the future. Go to your Google search engine and enter church closings. This morning I got 508,000 responses. A few of them had to do with finding out who was closing in case of snow or ice. But most of the entries, though, are about a much, much worse storm that is brewing. And so in this context, folks, God's people in America are walking away from God, which is all the more reason. I remember a, a, a teacher saying this, and it's really a good saying. And you and I have to have this attitude. It's an attitude Israel would have done good to have. Others may, I cannot. It has to be our attitude. Because we're going to see people let the Lord down. We're going to see people walk. We're going to see the Josh Harris's. He's not going to be the last one. And there's going to be many more that apostatize, that walk away from God. That cannot affect us. Because they are not why we walk with God. God is. And so you and I have to, others may, I cannot. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help us as we consider this challenge to Israel, Judah, of long ago from the lips of Jeremiah, the pen of Jeremiah and his, uh, his secretary. Father, I pray that we would take heed uh, because we live in such a day as that. We live in a day where folks are apostatizing and walking away from you. And uh, Father, help us to, to be able to put ourselves in your spot and see how much this means to you, that this is a a reflection against you, as if you've done something wrong. And Father, just because others walk away from you, uh, Lord, may we be more determined than ever. You have done nothing wrong. You've done everything right. You've sustained us. You've ministered to us. You've blessed us. You've strengthened us. You've answered our prayers. And Father, we have no legitimate reason to walk away from you so lord like the disciples uh, lord help us when uh, think of jesus turning to the disciples and saying will you also leave me and lord remind us help us to be like peter who said where else can we go lord you have the words of life may that be our attitude we pray in jesus precious name amen all right let's take our hymn books out let's stand and we will close in song By Megan. See ya.